Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about my Royal Air Force Navigator training between July 1967 and June 1968. And uh, it might be worth watching the light blue print on the current slide. In 1967, initial navigator training took place from three RAF stations. Number two air navigation school at RAF Guard Gaden provided basic navigator training. Number one ANS at RAF Stratisol provided advanced training. And the RAF College Cranwell provided training to a small number of flight cadets destined to become navigators. The basic course at Gaden lasted for eight months. A new course of 12 students arrived each month. All students were commissioned junior officers. Most were direct entry from school or civilian employment who had arrived via an officer training course. Occasionally, there would be a failed student pilot who had convinced the service that he'd make a satisfactory navigator. Or a former NCO air crewman who had impressed the service sufficiently to become commissioned and trained as a navigator. The RAF had no female air crew in the 1960s. Here we are. This is us on our first day. Fine body of men. Number 103, air navigator course. Students at Gaden flew roughly 100 hours, including 10 hours at night in the Vickers Varsity. The school also retained two Vickers Valletta T3 flying classrooms which could accommodate six students. You'll note the aircraft has six astrodomes. The Valettas were only used for, a very, for the very first bubble sextant familiarization flight, which was simple, simply to allow the students to practice their bubble sextants in the air. Training was split into two. Navigator training under a course commander and general duties training under a flight commander. Both were flight lieutenant navigators, as were most of the instructors on the unit, apart from the staff pilots. General duties training comprised Air Force law, service writing and first aid taught in the classroom, and sports, physical education, drill and combat survival training taught outside. Highlights were a visit to the London Law Courts, a weekend camping in Wales, a visit to an indoor ski slope, and a trip down a working coal mine, of all places. For me, rattling along in the darkness at unknown speed in the outermost seat of the paddy train was by far the most frightening part of the course. Unfortunately, our survival exercise had to take place on our own airfield because of foot and mouth restrictions. Navigation training was split into ground lessons and flying trips. The ground lessons were split into classroom lectures and practical exercises. The classroom lessons included dead reckoning navigation, flight instruments, compasses, airmanship, astro navigation, and radio and radar, all taught by flight lieutenant staff navigators, plus aviation medicine taught by the station medicine med medical officer, and meteorology taught by the senior metman. Practical exercises included classroom chart plotting exercises, plotting exercises in a very basic analog simulator called the DR trainer. 
and learning to take Morse with a master air signaller. We're also each required to hand in many celestial position lines, which we had pre-computed, observed from the ground with our bubble sections and plotted. On the first day, we were issued with an excellent navigator's bag, a pencil box, a navigator's ruler for drawing really long lines, dividers, a small, a square Douglas protractor, a modern version of the Dalton computer, a rubber, a pencil sharpener, a handful of pencils, and a crayon which had a red lead at one end and a blue lead at the other. We were also issued with a compass correcting key, which was used mainly to synchronise the M-type drive of heading to our air position indicator. We were issued with our sextants a few days later. The Hughes Mark 9 bubble sextant was probably the best bubble sextant in the worst case worst, worst container to emerge from World War II. The 100 hours varsity flying was split 50-50 between flights as first and second navigator. The first navigator navigated the aircraft and the second navigator assisted him and kept a safety plot using rapid G fixing. At the front of the aircraft was the staff pilot who was also the captain and next to him was a senior NCO air crewman, usually a master signaller, acting as pilot's assistant. The usual arrangement was that a procedure would be taught by the course commander, practiced in a classroom plot, practiced in the DR trainer, and, he f and finally flown in the varsity. Each exercise was flown twice, once as first and once as second navigator. Whether you flew as first or second nav first varied from trip to trip. Exercises were flown using one in one million Mercator plotting charts. These came with little more than a Latin long grid, an outline of land areas and lines of magnetic variation. There were no airways or danger areas printed. These had to be drawn on in your own time. The task was made easier by using a perspex outline of the airways system, which you drew round using your red blue crayon. Lines of magnetic variation were invariably out of date, so you had to be so these had to be corrected also. Care had to be taken with the choice of the few colour pencils available to us, for it wasn't unknown for a student under stress to start flying up a variation line or to incorporate one as a position line into a fix. All exercises, both on the ground and in the air, were assessed by a cell of flight lieutenant staff navigators. Exercises were assessed for accuracy and application. Accuracy concerned how accurately you measured lines, angles, or completed speed, distance, time calculations. Depending on how far you were outside limits, you lost marks for either a minor or a major error. Application marks were lost when you failed to follow the correct procedure, work rate, or showed poor navigational judgment. If a student failed an exercise, it was usually because of double deductions. After so many marks had been lost, any lost after that counted as double. This ensured problems were picked up and corrected early in training, rather than allowing a student to pass the course by just scraping through every exercise and then fail at a later, more expensive stage of training. A single exercise failed was usually reflown the next day, and no more was said. A second failed exercise 
led to review, followed by extra tuition, recourse or removal from training. Apart from the first couple of flights, there was no screen navigator, but the staff pilots knew their way around the course backwards with their eyes shut. It's remarkable how even in 1967, navigation fit and methods had changed little since World War II. Our varsity navigation fit included an airspeed indicator, altimeter and outside air temperature gauge to cal calculate true airspeed, plus a G4B magnetic compass. There was an astrodome in which you could either mount the astro compass to take visual bearings or hang your bubble sextant from a hook right in the top. There was a drift sight towards the rear of the fuselage. There was a manually tuned radio compass for use with medium wave radio beacons and for taking cons consult counts. There was also a, also a Becca, another World War II aid, which would give a range from a Eureka beacon. To allow some automation, we had the same air position indicator as had been introduced in World War II. For rapid fixing, we had a Mark III G set, which was little different from the Mark II set used in World War II. Exercises were built up in stages. The first couple of trips were flown using a manual airport. When we could do this, we progressed onto using the air position indicator. But for the first 20 minutes, we had to use both to ensure the air position indicator was working correctly, just like World War II. That's the main thing about navigator training. It's check, check, check. Towards the end of the guidance phase, there were ground examinations, which we all passed. Then, at the end of the course, after handing back our sextants, armfuls of our publications, we moved on after a short period of leave to number one ANS at Stratisol for a further four months. We lost two students at Gaiden, one medical and the other transferred to the air traffic control branch. We picked up two replacements, who were medical recourses from earlier courses. At Stratisol, six of us had been allocated to a low, slow varsity stream, and six to a high, fast dominant stream. But a temporary problem with the varsity led to us all moving onto the almost new dominant. This was a different world. The Domini cruised more than three times as high as the Varsity and about twice as fast. Consequently, the techniques were different and we navigated on one in two million Mercator charts. In 1967, the student navigators still faced backwards as the navigators did in a V-bomb although towards the end of the Dominion's life, they would be first forwards to match current combat aircraft. The Dominion had a state-of-the-art, for the time, navigation fit, including a radio compass, VHF omnidirectional range for airways flying, Echo 190 weather radar, but you could also use it for basic fixing, and a Hughes Mark II periscopic sextant. The aircraft also had Doppler drift and ground speed feeding into a ground position indicator Mark IV. For rapid fixing, we had Decker Mark I air. Decker was very accurate, but fixed plotting had to be done manually from a Decker chart, and the aircraft flew so fast that you didn't stop within range of each decker chain for very long. Chain changing was an art in itself. 
another fine body of men. Finally, the great day came when, having satisfied all the requirements, we were presented with our navigation badges at our passing out parade. This was followed immediately by a church service and a lunch to which parents or wives could be invited. Then came 14 days leave before we were off after a period of holding to the role we'd been allocated. Of the 12 members of our course, the top student got his first choice of photo reconnaissance canvas. Five were claimed by the V-Force to be trained as navigator radars, but one managed to escape to PR Canberra's whilst holding. Three went to the Hercules Medium Transport Force. One went to the Argosy Transport Force. One had requested and went to Shackleton's Maritime Reconnaissance Aircraft. And the twelfth, who was on a short service commission, went to a communications squadron. Looking at our subsequent careers, no one was killed or seriously injured in an aircraft accident. Two did use their ejection seats successfully. One reached the rank of wing commander. Five reached squadron leader and six retired as flight lieutenants, probably at their age 38 retirement option. I think the feeling of those who learned air navigation at the time and processed through their, progressed through their careers was that the courses, especially Gaiden, were probably 20 years out of date as far as operational techniques were concerned. In particular, they made no attempt at all to prepare students for two-man crew operations. Eventually, some years later, the course was massively updated to reflect current techniques and continued to be updated until the RAF stopped training navigators in 2011. Where the 1960s courses were very successful, was that they gave us such a thorough grounding in basic navigation theory that you could have dropped us into any land, maritime or airborne situation and we would have very quickly picked up and adapted to using local techniques. That's the end. Thank you.